This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I'm going to keep this short so we can get to the main event, and if any of you have looked at Peter Fan's website or Googled him, you will know what a very difficult task that is. He was ordained in 1972 in Vietnam, came to the U.S. in 1975, published his first book in English in 1984. He has three doctorates, one in theology, one in philosophy, and one in divinity from Rome and from London. He now teaches, he's taught a lot of places, he now teaches at Georgetown, and he actually admits to liking teaching undergraduates. Um, he edits several series of books, uh, one on global theology, one on pastoral spirituality, and he's written himself 15 books and uh, 300 articles, over 300 articles. He's a very comfortable and very fluent writer. I mean, I think a lot of you would enjoy just reading some of his books. His uh, writings cover a huge range of religious topics, including icons, social thought, social justice, death and eternal life, and especially interreligious dialogue. Um, his works have been translated into many languages, and he's especially interested in religious pluralism. He's also the first non-white president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. And he has a new book coming out on his encounters with the Vatican. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, so the topic, or let me just reintroduce or, or retell you that the title of the talk, and then we'll get right to it. World Christianity, its implications for history, religious studies, and theology. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight so late at 8 o'clock. I come from Washington. It's 11 o'clock there. If I fall asleep during the talk, it's not because of the company, but it's the time that uh, should be 11 o'clock at night in Washington, D.C. Allow me to begin by thanking the Board of Governors of the Burke Lectureship on Religion and Society. I took a look at a list of the past speakers, and I am very grateful to the Board of Governors for reaching down to the bottom of the barrel and pick me out for this lecture. I'm sure you must have run out of options when you think of me. <laughs> I share some similarities with the Father Eugene Burke, the honoree of these lectures. Like him, I taught at Catholic University. He, of course, taught 35 years. I taught at Catholic University for 15 years, and I saw the light and then I joined Georgetown University. Uh, I also a member of the Catholic Theological Society, which is founded, and like him, I was also its president and the uh, recipient of the John Connie Murray Award for Achievement in Theology. At the time, it was called Cardinal Spellman uh, Award, but we thought to choose a different name, to a Jesuit rather than a cardinal for that. <laughs> and finally, I also share great interest in uh, the ecumenical unity that he has worked. And tonight, the lecture would talk about that. The title of my lecture is World Christianity. And I see it's in three parts. The implication of this notion of world Christianity for church history, what you do about the church history, religious studies, because we are in a secular state university, and then theology for the Catholic people who are interested in theology. In recent decades, uh, before I forget, I'd like to thank all the people who come from USD 
the Catholic University in the United States, uh, people who, uh, whom I share uh, a lot in common with, Gerard Mannion, who is also here, and some other people, faculty from USD. Now, in recent decades, a new buzzword, world Christianity, has attracted widespread scholarly attention, especially in the fields of church history and missiology, theology of mission. At first blush, the expression world Christianity sounds either redundant or inaccurate. Redundant because the Christian faith is professed to be intrinsically Catholic with a small c, that is universal. So what's the point of talking about world Christianity if the Catholic faith is already Catholic universal? Inaccurate because Christianity is or has long been, uh, at least in the eyes of many, a Western religion, which successive waves of Western missionaries, first Catholic, then Protestant, and to a lesser extent Orthodox, brought to the other parts of the world, in Latin America, in Asia, Africa, and Oceania. So if you say world Christianity, historically speaking, and Suzanne, you are a world-class historian, you know that when you mention like that, you seem to negate the Western, essentially Western character of Christianity. That is an unpardonable historical error. Now, these two objections, with, uh, with, uh, notwithstanding, the concept of world Christianity has been steadily gaining currency in academic circles. If you do theology today, you know this word. Everybody talk about uh, world Christianity. Several universities and seminaries have established endowed chairs, unfortunately. UCSD has not done so, but we collect money tonight and we establish a chair in World Christianity, and I will be its first occupant, all right? <laughs> and lectureship in World Christianity. Uh, I publish a lot of specialized journals, study studies in World Christianity, and monograph. I am the editor of a new series of monographs published by Paul Gray Books and a title, Studies in World Christianity. So at least three or four volumes will come out in the next few years. So here you are, even though the term is, can be misunderstood, no doubt it is very widespread, and therefore we need to at least take a look at this new concept. I like to do that in three stages, being a teacher in Jesuit University, you can't do anything without three points. So what I like, to, first of all, to look at the concept of world Christianity. What does it mean? Second, its implication for studies, church history, and religious studies, because in most uh, state universities, you don't have department of theology. Your department of religious studies or religion. And so I'd like to explore the implications of what it means to have world Christianity and have, let's say, a department or a program here in religion at UCSD. And the last part, I'd like to explore the uh, implications for doing theology, particularly Catholic theology. So what does it mean, world Christianity? What is the meaning? When you look at the word Christianity, it's very funny because it compounds of two nouns, world and Christianity. Now, Americans have the terrible habit of using a noun as a verb. <laughs> Think of the word impact. I mean, when I heard the word impact as you as a word, I grinch because I know that's a noun, not a verb. Hmm? And yet, when you put these two things together, world, Christianity, one, the word world now as a noun function as an adjective, what does it mean? I suggest five possible ways of looking at this expression. 
when you use, for example, English, uh, French or uh, 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 Spanish Romance languages or Italian, you cannot use two nouns together, except in German. The German, you can put two nouns together and get a verb, uh, 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 an expression, like das Welt Christentum. <laughs> they love that. The Welt and Christentum, world Christianity. But in French, you can do that. You cannot put Christianist monde. You have to say Christianist or uh, mondial or Italian something. So when you put the two terms together, you don't know what you mean by this combination. Is it world in a sense of universal, you know, world, global? World means Christianity in the world, maybe, or Christianity of the world, so that's different meaning, or Christianity spread throughout the world, geographical, not one particular region. So you have a lot of ambiguities when you use the word word Christianity. Now, my first remark is this. When we scholars use the expression world Christianity, we do not mean Christendom. That is another word in English, very common. But it has nothing to do with Christendom. Christendom referred to the political religious order a sort of pope and emperor joined together, Caesaropapism, promoted by medieval popes such as Gregory VII in the 11th century and Innocent III in the 12th century. These popes want to promote a social, political, religious order in which the pope holds absolute universal power over everybody including the non-Christians. Now, this notion of Christendom as a political, social, religious order was destroyed around in the late 17th to 18th century by three things of modern civilization, namely gunpowder, printing, and the Protestant Reformation. So by the 17th, 18th century, Christendom was gone for good. And so world Christianity, when we speak about world Christianity, we do not at all mean that world that is gone, thankfully, thank God it's gone. Although it is not gone in the mind of many people in the Vatican. But still, that's not the point. The point is that it's gone. Now, the expression world Christianity is not a recent invention. It's not a recent coinage, even though now we use it. But uh, a friend of mine, Thomas Tangaraj, who held the chair of World Mission and Ecumenism at Vanderbilt School of Theology at Emory University, and when he arrived, he was interviewed for this chair, chairs called World Mission and Ecumenism. And when after he took the chair, eventually without his knowledge or consent, the chair was changed into chair in world Christianity. So I said, what the heck is this? Who, why, why do you change the, 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 the title of the chair? And it's very interesting because the changing from chair in world Christianity, a uh, world mission and ecumenism, to chair in world Christianity implies a, shall we say, paradigm shift, a change in the understanding of what it means. Because the earliest books with the title World Christianity dealt with two things: Christian missions and ecumenical unity, okay? So that's people say, when they look at the word Christianity, I remember these books uh, and these lectures that talks about how we have to do mission and how do we have to have unity among Christians that was broken. Now, why did 
the earliest writers, I give you a few names here. Um, Francis John McCardle in 1929, Henry Van Dusen in 1945, and the eminent church historian Kenneth Scott Latourette in 1960s. They all use the word world Christianity, but they mean something very different. First of all, they mean the necessity of carrying out mission to the non-Christian, announcing the good news. Now notice the year, 1929, 39, 45. What happened in this area in the West? War, the two war, First World War, Second World War. And what did this war, pardon the expression, impact on the Christian missions? The countries which emerge which acquire independence, told the missionaries, please go home. It means that by 1940s, late 40s, 50s, Christian missions as carried by Western missionaries to the Asia, Africa particularly, simply died out, either because these countries realize the fact that Christian missions have been in cahoots with colonization. They say, thank you very much, but it's about time for us we do it ourselves. Or because, as you know, these mission societies by the 1950s, if you still remember, have lost memberships. Many religious orders, now talking about Catholic Church now, by 1960s, those religious orders that were engaged in Christian mission, the Jesuits, the Society Divine Word, the Mary Nolas, by 1960s, there were a huge exodus of priests and sisters and so there were no missionaries. So combining these things, people who were in 1950s, when they talk about world Christianity, they meant we have to retake, rebegin, re begin uh, the enterprise of Christian mission. The second thing that happened in those decades, finally they realized the necessity of ecumenical unity. Look at Father Buck activities. It arrived at the time when the church, particularly after the Council of Vatican II, 1962, 1965, they realized we, our preaching, our message about Jesus is not credible unless we Christians, we are united uh, among ourselves. Remember famous words of Gandhi. Jesus, the message of Jesus is so credible we love it, we follow it, but you Christians, go back and reconcile yourself first before you can come and tell us and we believe you. So there, that's the context of the first use of the word expression, word Christianity. Now, what I mean by that expression today, what I many others go use, we do not mean Christian missions, nor do we mean ecumenical unity important as they are. What we mean is this, by this expression, we mean the historical, sociological, cultural, and theological diversity and multiply, multiplicity of Christianity. That's what we realize today. We realize today more than ever that there is not one Christianity has never been, although it has been imagined that way, it has never been one Christianity, but always Christianities in the plural, all of the world and all the time. This is a vivid awareness 
that Christianity is plural, diverse within itself from the very beginning and throughout history. That is indeed a threatening realization. Now, if there is unity to Christianity, it resides in the common faith in Jesus, or better still, in the God revealed by Jesus and in the reign of God that Jesus proclaimed and inaugurated. But this one faith is, has been, is expressed and practiced in myriad ways and in different locations, which altogether constitute what we call world Christianity. Christianity has always been in contemporary balance, inculturated or contextualized. These are two words, the Catholic favor the first word, inculturation, the Protestant favor the second word, contextualization, but they mean the same thing. Namely that there is or there has been intrinsic within Christianity this up diverse and diversity and plurality and multiplicity. There is not one form of Christianity, be it of Rome, first Rome, or Constantinople, the second Rome, or Moscow, the third Rome, that's what they call themselves, first Rome, second Rome, third Rome, or of Canterbury, of Geneva, of Beijing, or let me add, of San Diego. <laughs> There's none. They're always different. Each of these local incarnations of Christianity embodies in its own unique way something of Christianity. And all of these forms, all of the incarnations make up world Christianity. In other words, Christianity does not exist except as world Christianity. And world Christianity is not something ontologically prior to its local incarnations. As Cardinal Rasinger used to argue against Cardinal Walter Casper, he thinks there is this sort of Christianity somehow universal and then come down to its local. I argue just the opposite. There is no platonic form floating up there and come down and incarnated. Rather, it's always been different. It's a Chinese Christianity, a Vietnamese Christianity, a American Christianity, and God forbid, Canadian Christianity. <laughs> uh, uh, all, and together, they form this Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is not something up there and realized locally. It is constituted, it is made up of these diverse local Christianities. Three consequences for this, practical consequences. First, we must recognize all local forms of Christianity as forms of the Christian faith. We must truly recognize that they are form of Christian faith not lesser, not degenerated, not lower form of Christianity. Second, the notion of world Christianity relativizes all local expression of Christianity in the sense that no one form of Christianity can allow, can call, can claim to be the norm of other Christianities. And third, interestingly, world Christianity enables the revitalization of Christianity. Why? Because by acknowledging all the forms of Christianity, they can come and learn from each other. Rather than saying, my form of Christianity must be the norm for others. Roman Christianity is the norm of other Christianities. So it relativizes, at the same time, it revitalizes this form of Christianity. So you get the idea. 
That's what I mean by work Christianity. I don't mean mission, although it's important. I don't mean ecumenical unit, that's important. I mean the intrinsic plurality, diversity, multiplicity of Christianity, all of whom, over which are valid and must be recognized as valid, and must be brought into conversation with each other. Let me move now to the second part. How do you do church history then? What is church history and history of world Christianity? Uh, for many of us religious scholars, theologians, who had done graduate studies in the history of Christianity before the new concept of world Christianity had gained academic credibility and currency, so people in the 60s, like myself, who did theology in the early 60s and stuff like that, go to uh, seminaries or uh, school of divinity. When they mean history of Christianity, what do they mean? They mean church history. Or more precisely, Western churches. So if you, go, if you went at the time, you go to anywhere, you do a, a PhD in church history, what did you do? History of churches. And what do you mean by that? The hierarchy, the organization. Catholic University, where uh, I, I taught for 15 years, there is the department of ecclesiastical history. History means the history of churches. Okay. Why? Oh, well, because the most have done in the West, uh, because of faculty resources, library resources. So if you want to do church history in, uh, in the United States or much worse in Rome, the only thing you could do is history of bishops, popes, so forth. Now, it was from this vantage point that the history of Christianity was generally construed. A glance at church history textbooks written by Europeans before 1960s will confirm my hypothesis, my claim. There is, of course, an acknowledgment of Christ that Christianity originated in the Middle East not the Middle West, it's called in the Middle East. But if you took these books, and I'm glad you don't read them anymore, <laughs> you get the impression that somehow Christianity originated with Jesus in Palestine, but soon after his death, Paul, Peter, all went to Rome, eventually, they were uh, murder there, martyr there, and Rome then become like, and often I use the image of airline hub. <laughs> you go to airline, you look at the map, and you have all these from one center, you all of the world, you know? So like, I don't know, San Diego has any airline for it? No, thank God. But let's say American airline, you go to Dallas, you fly all of the world. This is the way how people picture Christianity. It somehow originated from Rome. What a terrible narrative and propaganda of this uh, history of Christian mission. Now, this ecclesiastical historiography or church history has been roundly critiqued by the major proponents of world Christianity. Uh, I just give a few names if you're interested in. Husserl Gonzalez, Andrew Walsh, a Scott uh, historian, Lamin Sané, who's now teaching at Yale, Dale Irving, Wilbur Schenk, Mark Ne, uh, Mark, um, uh, sorry, Mark Knoll, N-O-L-L, -L, who now teaching, and he's not Catholic, but he's teaching at the University of Notre Dame, and Philip Jenkins, all of whom are my friends or are count as friends. What happened when you do church history as history of 
world Christianity. I suggest two images. The first image is cartography, map making. And second is topography, the place. Those who engineer knows very well how you draw the place. Now, if you look church history and expand its map, its cartography, you realize that in the last 20, 30 years, there has been an earthquake going on, a tsunami, if you will. What happened in the last 30, 40 years? There has been, even though when I look at the audience, I don't see too much, but let me assure you, there has been a demographic shift from the so-called global north, Europe and the United States and Canada, <laughs> to the global south, meaning Asia, Africa, Latin America. I give you a few facts just to wake you up. In 1900, in Africa, there were 10 million Christians. The year 2000, 100 years later, there are 300 million Christians. And for those of you who are mathematically challenged like myself, that's more than double. <laughs> From 10 to 300. Now, it is projected, but by the year 2050, another 40 years, out of five Christians, Four live in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Sorry, wake up and smell the coffee. In a matter of 40 years, four out of five will not be white. Think for a moment what an ecumenical council would do if the majority of the members of the council will not be German or French or Italian. Who decides the agenda? Who will vote? Who will elaborate the text? Vatican II was celebrated as a, Carano says, a world church. I admire Carano and I said, right. But wait another 50 years, Carano, you will see that the world church of Vatican II was dominated by mostly German and French. But wait, if you ever call another council, what difference that will make? In other words, when you look at cartography, there has been a total shift of the map Map making is ideological, believe me. It's all how you draw the map. Who will be the west, who will be the east, okay? So map making is deeply. Uh, who will lie at the center of the map? How you draw Christianity, where is the center? Instead of talking about one center, we have to talk about poly center. Many centers, just that happened today in economy, in world politics, it will also happen in the church. Topography. What does it mean? It means that today we have to focus on Christianity not as, I put it, an export product from the West to the rest but as an import product, meaning as a historian, it is far more realistic and interesting not to see how it was exported from the West, 
but how the local people themselves have received and transformed these products to reflect the local situation. And that sort of church history is far more interesting than the history of missions and bishops who build churches and hospitals and things like that. It means, therefore, for us today to be able to understand what happened in the church, we need to look at the concept of world Christianity. For a moment, let me uh, tell you. When I study uh, theology and church history, ecclesiastical history, to look at the book, you know, a beginning, may, uh, let's say a book of 300 pages, and you have about 20, 25 pages, Jesus, the apostles, and things like that. And then the big bulk of the book is about the Church of the West, the papacy, the struggle between the Pope and the Emperor, the Reformation, and the struggle of the Church against modernity. That's basically it. And I look, I ask myself, how do you write that sort of history? Why do you bring the kind of division in during the Reformation, Protestant, Catholic, and then Protestant, you have Anglican, you have Presbyterian, you have Baptist, you are Lutheran, you are Calvinist. What the hell does it have to do with me as being a Christian in Asia? Why do you import this sort, I call them family quarrels, to our place and make it 300 pages of church history, 280 pages about them? Why? And this is sort of intellectual imperialism. We read church history from the Western perspective. Our cartography has shifted and our topography has changed. Okay? Now, let me to the questions of world Christianity in religious studies. You have a program, religious studies here. I ask myself, how do you do this? A famous Japanese-American historian, Tomoko Masuzawa, you might have heard of her name, she wrote a book called The Invention of Religions, Invention of World Religions. She is very controversial. She said, uh, basically, that when you use the word religion in the, up to the 18th century, the word religion means three things, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That's world religion. By the 19th century, Christians in the West discover something new, and they call it the Oriental religions, basically Hinduism and Buddhism. And they say, oh, how do we do this? How do you put them in? Because so far, the word religion refers only to three types. So they say, OK, let's invent a new category called world religion. So you nick them in and say, OK, now they too can be called religion. And Christianity and Judaism, Christian, Islam are, are, are accounted among them. Now, this historic account has been challenged by historians, and I think it's fine. I, I, I don't want to enter the dispute. But my question is this. What happened when you invent this category of world religion? And what is world Christianity in comparison with? And how do you teach world Christianity in, let's say, UCSD, which is a state school? I would say, first, world Christianity is not world religion. Because in world Christianity, 
Christians do make some theological claim about Jesus, about other uh, realities. Whereas, as we know, Christianity as world religion, as taught at UCSD and many other places, does not and cannot make such theological claim. Second, when you use the word world religion and include Christianity and Judaism and many others, Confucianism and, and Hinduism, Buddhism, what happened theologically? Happened is that Christianity now is considered as one of the many religions, no longer the religion, no longer the only true religion or the only one that deserves to be called religion. Right? Third, when we teach Christianity as world religion, as UCSD, professors who teach this course either as part of world religions or as an upper level uh, 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 course, professors are expected to offer a historical, phenomenological, expository, and uh, most importantly, ideological neutral presentation to the students. You cannot pick out one religion and choose it as a normative for all the rest. Therefore, it is no longer church history the way it's taught in a seminary. Nevertheless, I suggest that those who teach in state universities and those who teach in seminaries and denominational schools have a lot to learn from each other, even though they make very different claims and even though their method is very different. One is theological, the other is descriptive and historical and expository. I suggest, first of all, that both of them would focus on the local communities, the topography, and the new cartography that I mentioned earlier. And there is not this idea of Christianity as a Western religion exported to other parts of the world. Second, I suggest those who teach uh, at UCSD, if you happen to teach a course on world religion, and including Christianity, please pay attention not to what the bishops do, the priests do, but pay attention to popular piety and religious practices at the grassroots level. What do these what, does, oh, what do the people in this particular parish do? What do people, Cubans do? What do Mexicans do? What Vietnamese do in this particular community of faith? That's how we get to the sense of what Christian, not just doctrine, beliefs and all that, but how day to day this community lay out the Christian. Third, I suggest, if you uh, want uh, to put in your curriculum, uh, to your um, syllabi, please pay attention to the presence of evangelical Pentecostal movements. We scholars have this terrible bias against them. We think of them as backward, as anti-science, as uh, even close-minded, and we don't pay attention to them. Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman, to the contrary. <laughs> the evangelicals are not and should not and should not be car caricature in that way. If we look at them that way, we miss the boat in a big way. The presence of evangelicals slash 
charismatics, less uh, 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 Pentecost, uh, uh, absolute presence. But if we want to understand Christianity today and world Christianity, you have to focus on them. Take any textbook of church history and you see that their faces are either caricature or erased. But do you want to understand Christianity in Brazil, in China? You have to pay attention to these uh, explosive, the fastest growing Christian denomination are the Pentecostals. Fastest growing. There are more than 500 million of them in the world. And mainline scholars, historical scholars, don't pay attention to them at all because they think, well, you know, they are just can be dismissed as country folks, redneck, and so forth. And this one brings me to a conclusion if we uh, end it today, uh, tonight is that we, people of the global north, have a terrible difficulty to understand the Christianity of the global south. Why? Because we are children of the enlightenment. We cannot tolerate miracles. We cannot tolerate prophecy. We cannot tolerate exorcism. We cannot tolerate Glossolalia, speaking in tongues, because they do not fall within our modern scientific worldview. And we write them off as psychological nut jobs, you know. And we don't understand that this Christianity, this world Christianity, is growing and among us if you want to understand them. Let me conclude then with a question. Now, as Catholic theologians, Catholic who engage in the work of reflection on the faith. What do we do on this? I would suggest two basic ideas. First, there is a different way of doing theology. The way we were trained to do theology is to begin with the Bible, and then the fathers of the church, and then the theologians, and then most importantly, what the magisterium teaches, the popes, the councils, the catechisms. Speaking of Asian theology in particular, they said no, the way we do theology is to start with the context where we are. But the context is not simply the locale, the venue where we do theology, where you do theology, but the context is where you begin your theological reflection. We have the whole range of new sources in which from which we engage in this theological reflection, what it means to be a believer today, be it a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist and so forth. And second, for us today, Catholics, to do Christian theology in this world Christianity is extremely hazardous to your health and your academic career. Why? Because some of the truths that we have taken for absolutely settled, resolved, are no longer so. I just mentioned two, just not to be too controversial. We Christians profess that Jesus is the only, the unique, universal savior of the world. That seems to be settled, non-negotiable, 
absolute truth, at least for Catholics. What do we do when we go to China and we see Buddhists who are holier than we are, <laughs> who pray harder than we do, who fast 365 days a year? What happened to this truth that there is no salvation outside the church? Therefore, we do not theologize from some abstract theological principle that we take for settled, but we allow our experience of what it means to be a religious person from these people we consider pagan or unredeemed or damned, they challenge us to rethink what we've taken for granted for so long. Again, to take another example, the church. We have expert here, Jeremanian on ecclesiology. How do we understand church? We understand church as an institution with all the authorities in the hierarchies and, you know, and then you have the laity. And in spite of Vatican II, multiplicity of images, Lumen Gentium talks about church as mystery, church as people of God, church as mystical body, church as community of a, 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 a mystical, sacramental community, and church as service, servant to the world. We have this multiplicity of image of the church, but when the rubber meets the road, what do we say? The church is what the Pope says. And anything that comes out of Rome, especially if it's written in Latin, Assume immediate infallible authority. Why that? But uh, we just think like this. You know, if it comes from Rome, it must be true. And infallible, true, and normative for all. What are the images of the church that Vatican II offers us as people of God? In which what is most important is whether you ordain or not but your baptismal vocation that make us rooted in this community of believers. In spite of all our theory about this, in practice, we come back to that Western, very much hierarchical vision of the church that reigned from Constantine to our time. I could go on forever, but let me conclude this uh, uh, this example. It is extremely hazardous to predict what world Christianity will look like, precisely because, as I said, it is diverse and multiple, especially in the global south. And their polycentricity, the many centers, has vast implication for the way we look at Christianity, religious studies, I think it would challenge most of us who teach in religious studies, and theology. What will survive? What will be the key essential elements in this world Christianity? I cannot look at this globe and tell you uh, how it look like. Pronosticating the future religion, especially of Christianity, is an extremely hazardous business. Their obituaries, like that of Mark Twain, have been vastly premature, and their intrepid forecasters of the death of God and of religion, from Nietzsche to Marx to Freud and to the so-called New Ages, have been buried if not by God, certainly by religion. Those forecasters of the death of God must now turn in their grave because there has been what we call the return of religion in the public square, far more than we ever imagined. 
Just look at the tea party and you see it. <laughs> but if out of modesty, we should refrain from prognosticating the future world Christianity, we can at least reflect on what Christians must do and how well to respond to new challenges facing world Christianity. So that we can look into the future with much hope, with much modesty on what it looked like, and with openness to the possibilities of new form of Christianity that will emerge. I will give up the list. You can add your own list. But the important thing for Christians to remember, and I think it's so wonderful in honor of Jean Burke, is that the future of world Christianity is not in Christians' hands. Those, of course, they do have a part to play. Rather, its future lies in the faithfulness and loving mercy of God, the famous God's emet and hezet. To use two descriptions of God in the Hebrew Bible, God's fidelity and God's mercy. And these two characteristics of God, God's faithfulness, emet, and God's merciful love, he said, Jesus himself embodied in his promise, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Thank you very much. <laughs>